I'm going to talk a little bit about the physiology of both aerobic and dexterity performance. Um, just for those of you who do not know where I'm from, uh, I'm from the uh, Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine in Natick, Massachusetts. So just to kind of give you an outline of what we're going to talk about uh, this morning, uh, I've basically broken this into two sections, uh, aerobic performance and dexterity. So the talks will be about half for each. Um, the one thing I want you to think about as you think about the uh, you know, outline for the speaker, uh, my talk today, is that many of the, what I'm going to show you, is, is, you know, isn't as recent as we would think. And so there's a lot of opportunity for the future, and that's kind of what I wanted to get across today, for some really, I think, interesting work that still needs to be done in this area. Uh, so think about that as I go through the talk today, uh, as, we, as we touch on each of these different subjects. So a couple of years ago, Mike and I had the uh, opportunity to sort of survey the literature and, uh, 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 in, a, in a paper in comprehensive physiology. And, and so we you know, basically put together uh, a list of possible mechanisms that may limit aerobic performance. Uh, and so obviously an important one is a, is a change in temperature. Uh, lower deep body temperature, very important, as well as a decrease in muscle temperature along with that. Uh, and then also the possibility of a reduced skin temperature and something we'll kind of visit during some of the uh, cold air experiments. Uh, so we're going to touch on that a little bit. Uh, for metabolism, again, there's some different uh, potential mechanisms. Um, for today and, and, and in brevity, we're going to talk a little bit about maybe an increase in anaerobic metabolism. Uh, and then finally, one of the major effects may potentially be a change in central or peripheral circulation uh, with these particular changes. So that gives us sort of an outline of, of for the aerobic portion of this talk of, of what we'll be looking at in terms of potential mechanisms and what have been done. So when we look at some of the classic work that was done by Ulfberg, and this goes back you know, many decades, uh, it basically classically showed that temperature does have an effect on work performance and aerobic uh, uh, capacity. And Essentially, what, what was done in these experiments is that they had uh, individuals that were immersed in cold water for a set period of time to reduce their, both their deep body and their uh, muscle temperature. Uh, and then they had them do combined arm and cycle exercise. And so if we look at this first slide over here, we look at maximal work time, we can see that you know, maximal work time is, is best uh, when we had deep body and muscle temperatures that were between 38 to 40 degrees Celsius. But as they lower these uh, temperatures, you can see re you know, reduced work performance. And then at, you know, at 35 degrees, it's, it's, it's pretty minimal. Um, so essentially, what they showed is a linear decrease of about 5 to 6 percent uh, uh, in work time, as well as in VO2 max uh, per degree fall in Celsius. Uh, so again, here's just looking at maximal oxygen uptake. So this basically tracks the same uh, very much. Uh, so again, gives us sort of the basis for, yes, changes in deep body temperature, muscle temperature have a, a profound effect on our aerobic performance. But that leads to an interesting question, is, which is why? And what are some possible limiting mechanisms for what, what are observed in these particular studies? Um, and one of the questions that was asked is really, is, is it oxygen availability? Is it just a limiting ability to move oxygen to that working muscle to do, do the work? Uh, so this was uh, studied actually recently, just a year ago, uh, from the laboratory of Stephen Chung, uh, who looked at basically the effect of a combination of hypothermia, but then gave back to the volunteers an increase in oxygen, uh, percent oxygen, uh, up to 40%, uh, the FiO2 here of 0.4, essentially to see if it's oxygen availability which was causing this change in, in aerobic performance. Um, so in these set of experiments, uh, Chung uh, and, and, and Ferguson and, 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 and group uh, basically uh, looked at time trial performance, which was a 15 kilometer time trial on a cycle ergometer. And you can see that they had, a, during a neutral condition, they had a, a 24.7 minutes uh, of, a, of a, you know, time trial run. And then when they were exercised, when they had a deep body temperature that fell by 0.5 degrees Celsius, you can see about a 2% decrement in their physical performance. Um, so interesting, when they add it back, uh, the, the hyperoxia, uh, the FiO2 of 0.4, is that it potentially it brought back that decrement so that it was equal to the, to the neutral condition or the warmer condition. Um, and if we look at some of their data here, 
uh, we can see that the oxygen saturation, you know, during exercise uh, and this intense exercise falls uh, over the course of the 15 kilometers. Uh, and, and as expected, of course, you should see basically uh, uh, the uh, saturation is the same essentially as it and went up a little bit during, uh, during exercise when they were given uh, high oxygen levels. Uh, but what's interesting about this work is that they also measured cerebral uh, blood flow as well as, uh, as, well as, as muscle uh, flow looking at uh, using uh, near-infrared spectroscopy. spectroscopy. Um, and so looking at the, this slide here, uh, looking at the cerebral uh, index for uh, oxygenation, Essentially, what they showed uh, in these studies is that when you gave uh, this hyperoxia, essentially that uh, the cerebral uh, tissue oxygenation index uh, was similar to the neutral condition and was greater than cold. So again, providing maybe some evidence of why they worked a little bit better when they were given the higher oxygen levels. Um, and uh, again, maybe suggested of maybe a central drive that's going on here. Uh, and similarly, um, they found that you know, muscle tissue oxygenation index was also uh, higher when they were given the oxygen. Uh, so again, maybe oxygen availability really is the issue here uh, with uh, basically the lack of performance when we have a decrease in deep body temperature. But along with this, we know that muscle blood flow is also impacted. And of course, this may be the delivery, of course, of this oxygen. Um, again, classic studies from Rennie back in, uh, you know, many decades ago, uh, looking at, at changes in muscle blood flow. Um, in their experiments, they essentially had three different uh, exercise intensities. Oops, excuse me. Uh, where, you know, we had rest. Uh, working at about a liter per minute, three liters per minute, and then they basically decreased, they had changes in water temperature. And you can see that, that uh, muscle blood flow uh, decreases uh, as, as the water temperature, as they exercised at, at lower water temperatures. Uh, and this was seen in all, all the exercise intensities. Uh, classic studies using uh, xenon clearance. Um, more recently, but still a few decades old, uh, is this work from Ishii also showing that when you had them exercising, um, at around 70% of VO2 max is that when they decrease muscle temperature down to 28 degrees compared to 35, uh, whether they were exercising um, uh, at 75 watts and then eventually 125 watts, they went a little bit higher than this uh, during the experiments, but you could see that there's a decrease in muscle blood flow as well. So again, suggestive that oxygen delivery is impaired uh, in a cold environment. Um, there's some other recent work showing some of this from Gregson uh, with femoral artery blood flow using uh, laser Doppler, uh, Doppler ultrasound, sorry, and then also skin surface cooling. Wilson showed a decreased brachial artery uh, blood flow as well. Uh, so again, suggested that both deep body cooling or, deep, or muscle cooling, along with maybe even just surface cooling, is decreasing muscle uh, blood flow, potentially decreasing oxygen availability. If we look at cold effects on force velocity, um, again, classic work from Davies and Young, where they had individuals, uh, again, sit in cold water to decrease temperatures uh, in the muscle, uh, and then had them work on a force bike, uh, and essentially show this 31% decline in peak power, as well as a very large decrease in average power. Uh, again, classically showing that for any given force, uh, on the bicycle, that as the muscle temperature falls uh, from you know 37-ish down to around 28, that you can see a shift to the left in this curve, so that at any given force, you could produce you know basically less velocity. Uh, so again, giving us some impetus that you know cooling of muscle is very important. Uh, so very very classic work. Cold muscle is, a, is not, you know, is something that we need to, to not have happen if we want people to perform maximally. But what's interesting is that if we look at some other studies that, that are a little bit different, we see similar types of results, but, but the mechanisms are not as, as clear. Um, so these are two studies that have been done. Uh, you know, one, again, the classic study from Galloway and Mon in 97, and then Marianne Sunstand's work in, in, uh, a few years ago basically showing that when you have individuals exercising, uh, whether at a, at a you know, fixed VO2 or, or essentially a ramp type protocol, 
uh, you still see changes in the cold. The difference here is unlike the work, from, like work you know, we saw with both Berg and the others and Davies and from uh, 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 Stevens lab is that we don't have a decrease in, in deep body temperature here. We have individuals just beginning to exercise uh, in different ambient and temperatures. So if we look at the Galloway study, we basically see this inverted U. Uh, so that maximal work was actually performed at about a re around 11 degrees Celsius. Uh, and when they exercised at four degrees C, they had about a 15% decline in aerobic performance uh, or time to exhaustion uh, in this particular study. And you can see that they're, they're wearing shorts and t-shirt, and again, they're exercising at about 70% of, of VO2 max until exhaustion. Um, similarly, uh, Sanson showed a, a, sort of the same inverted U. Uh, treadmill work, uh, rather than, than cycle ergometry, a little different where they had doing a submaximal ramp where they basically increase exercise intensity uh, over many different uh, uh, stages until they try work maximally at the end. Um, that's why we see a little bit difference in time to exhaustion here. But essentially what they showed is that at minus four and one degree Celsius, they had their maximal performance. A little different setup than Galloway and Juan because they're wearing cross country skiing clothing. So they're, they're better clothed, they have better insulation. Um, but when they exercise at minus nine and then at minus 14, you can see a seven to 10% decline in performance. But what's important here is again, there's no change, what we say in thermal balance. The deep body temperatures are actually going up and I'll show that in a moment. Skin temperatures, of course, are falling, uh, but they're, they're warm relatively. We would think that their muscles are also warm. So if we start thinking about this, what, what is causing this potential decrease in exercise performance? Again, not all studies have shown this, but these are two classic ones. Um, again, if we look at deep body temperature, we can see that they were very similar between you know, the maximal place at 11 versus four here in Galloway and Mon. The difference is, is that skin temperature was, were down uh, around two and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, very similar again in, in, in sand sun where again, you know, rectal temperature is similar, but skin temperatures are, are lower. Does that kind of give us an idea that does lower skin equal a decrease in muscle temperature? Is there a correlation there? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, one thing we do know, again, uh, some work from Chung, uh, is that skin cooling, even with fairly high deep body temperatures, uh, decreased isokinetic force production. Uh, so they, again, it gives us again, some idea that maybe, you know, the decrease in performance, even in, in a cold air environment, um, is caused by potentially uh, a decrease in muscle. Uh, we just don't know that. And that gives us, again, an area that I think is very uh, relevant and, and is for future work uh, to find out what's going on with performance here. And then finally, this is the, sort of the last slide for the aerobic section, uh, is to look at an, a change in potentially from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. Um, so the work on the, on the right, on the left, sorry, from Blomstrand, uh, again, uh, going back several uh, years, uh, basically looked at muscle lactates uh, within the muscle when you compared between 35 degrees C muscle temperature and a 28 degrees C temperature. Um, and we're just looking at these particular sets of slides. We're looking at both type 1 and type 2 fibers. So obviously no change at rest when they exercised. Uh, and they were exercising here around 350 watts of external work. Um, you can see both in the type 1 fiber are slow twitch fibers, you have an increase in muscle lactate and a very large increase in muscle lactate in our type two fibers or our fast twitch fibers. Uh, so again, giving us some evidence that maybe there's a potential switch over from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism in the cold. Uh, more recent work from Ito uh, during uh, running exercise uh, at around 70% of VO2, uh, again, sort of shows the same, same idea. The, in this conditions, basically, they had them running in the cold in five degrees C um, where they, you know, exercised uh, over about a 30 minute time period and they basically made them colder by having it rain on them uh, while they were running in this five degree C environment. Uh, and we see an increase in plasma lactate. Uh, so again, it gives us sort of some evidence that, yeah, we have an increase in, in anaerobic metabolism. What's kind of interesting is that 
is there an increased recruitment of type 2 fibers preferentially over type 1? Um, this is a question we don't know in human beings. Um, there's interesting work that, again, is quite old, uh, that in carp, uh, is that when they swim and go from a warm sort of water environment to cold water, they actually switch over uh, from a type 1 fiber slow twitch to a type 2. Uh, so there's some evidence for that. Uh, again, we don't know this in humans. And again, it's fruitful area. Kind of interesting, too, we know that in rats, for example, cold acclimation uh, in a rat model will change basically uh, use of muscle fibers from a type 1 to a type 2. Um, so that kind of gives us an idea that we've got sort of these multiple mechanisms going on, uh, and, and at least in this case, a change from an aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. So now we're going to completely switch areas, and we're going to move from aerobic performance to dexterity. Um, and from a cold weather perspective, at least for the folks that I work for, uh, Basically, the hands and the use of the hands are probably the most important problem that they have in a cold weather environment. I just showed a couple, I have a couple of pictures here that I, I like to show. You know, one is you could think about a casualty down in a very cold weather environment. How do you treat this individual? If you've got a medic uh, who has to, to put an IV or do something else with a cold weather casualty, how well do they do that job if they've got to take their gloves off? Because most times we do need to take our gloves off. De gloves themselves decrease dexterity, you know, 60 to 70 percent. Um, so that's, that's an issue. Uh, and again, I just show a, me a mechanic over here who has to work on an airplane, for example, and has to use tools, which you have the issue of the hands as well as very cold metal. Uh, and so you have conductive cooling. Uh, so it's, it's obviously a big issue, uh, both in our world in the military, but also obviously thinking about construction workers, line workers, all kinds of folks who do jo occupational jobs where their hands are quite important. So if we look at what happens with dexterity and tissue temperatures uh, as we decrease, um, this is sort of a, a, you know, what we put together uh, a few years ago from many different sources. We know that when tissue temperatures reach certain areas, we see a decrease in performance. Um, we see like muscle strength and power and endurance is decreased at around you know, less than 28 degrees C. Uh, joint mobility decreases as well. And then nerve conduction velocity also decreases when we get down to temperatures below 20. In terms of skin temperature and dexterity and what we classically use to define that, uh, basically make the point that we see a very large degradation in dexterity when we get below 15 degrees C skin temperatures in the hands and the fingers. Um, it, it decreases before this, but it's really that break-off point that most studies have shown. At 15, you see a very large decrease in dexterity. And of course, we lose our ability to actually feel things when we're below about 8. So very important to try to improve this, uh, if we can, uh, in a cold environment. Now, to give it uh, just a, an idea of some of the physiology behind the dexterity, um, got a couple of studies here I just wanted to show. Um, one is, is, is basically looking at what happens with sort of the performance around the hand um, in terms of uh, work around, the, for, for example, wrist flexion and extension, uh, basically showing what's called the fatigue index or, or what's happening with uh, the in, you know, ability to contract over time. Uh, so in these particular sets of experiments, uh, you know, we see about a 15% decrement over time when it's warm at 25 degrees C. Um, interesting set of experiments where they had individuals just have local cooling at 5 degrees uh, that, their, that their, uh, hand, or their hands were exposed to. And they had about, a, you know, basically a, a decrease from 15% decrease to a 44% decrease in wrist flexion extension work. Um, when they actually had a whole body cooling protocol, it actually all went up to an 82% decline. Uh, so there's a local effect, but there's also a possible central effect. Uh, more recently, Lloyd uh, from uh, uh, George Havenis lab at Loughborough uh, showed the basically change in, in, in uh, MDC force um, over time, uh, looking at maximal voluntary contractions. Um, we're really just going to concentrate. This was a, a, a fairly well-designed study that, that but it looked at many different things, including hypoxia, which I'm, I'm going to sort of disregard for today's talk. Uh, 
But essentially, you could see in the neutral condition is that you get a, you know, this 10% decrease over time while they were in a five degree air environment. Uh, but in the cold, um, I'm sorry, this is, so this is actually not in the five, this is the neutral condition where it's not cold. Um, and then in the cold experiment where it's five degree air and they're doing this sort of, you know, basically you know, grip uh, work, uh, you can see that the decline is, is down near around 20% by the last MVC measurement. Um, so you can see that they're, they had a basically a 25% greater fatigue in the cold alone compared to neutral. So again, we know that the muscle force is, is less in a cold environment. What happens when we just put our hands in cold water and our arms in cold water? Uh, this is work again from Chung, uh, basically showing changes in both fine motor dexterity as well as in uh, a sort of a, a, a task, a manual task that's very functional. Um, and we can see that we see, you know, over, you know, depending on how long you immerse uh, the arm and the, and, the, uh, and the hand, you can start to see decreases in both fine motor dexterity as well a decrease in the ability functionally to buckle uh, a strap. Uh, so again, just that very local cold exposure is going to cause changes in, in hand function. In terms of just some of the physiology that's going on with the hand, um, again, I'm not going to spend the time. There's others in the room that know a lot more about this than I do. Um, we know there's actually two different uh, mechanisms for uh, blood flow control in the hand. We have basically the, the non-acral side or the dorsal side of the hand or the hairy side. Um, and there's an active vas vasodilator system that's present there so that it will react uh, to, increase, to changes with nitric oxide and others. Um, there's also local reflex cooling uh, that's mediated by alpha-2 receptors, uh, actually more specifically alpha-2C receptors. Uh, so that's basically where cooling affects those receptors and, decre and increases vasoconstriction. Um, in terms of the transmitters uh, that are involved, norepinephrine obviously being primary as a, as a noradrenergic system. Uh, but in hairy skin, uh, in other areas, in the, mostly in the forearm, is that we know that there's non-noradrenergic systems such as neuropeptide Y, y and rho kinase um, that have been shown in, in ventral forearm uh, in hairy skin. Um, those have not been studied in the hand, to my knowledge, um, but it's likely that they're present, uh, again, since it's, it's very similar to what we see in other areas of the forearm. In terms of the palm side or the ventral side, uh, we see uh, basically there's no active vasodilator system, and primarily it's under sympathetic control. We have uh, arteriovenous anastomoses, uh, and that cooling augments basically alpha-2 receptors in the fingers. Uh, so the question that we kind of, you know, begs to us is that, are there ways to overcome this? Uh, are there countermeasures that can reverse the vasoconstriction that occurs in the hands? Uh, and can we reverse this? Uh, so I'm just basically going to concentrate on some heating studies that, have, that we, that we, uh, other, you know, others and that we have done recently. Um, so first sets of experiments were done with torso heating uh, from uh, Michelle Ducharme's lab. And basically showing that if you have individuals sitting in a very cold environment, well clothed, but hands open, um, you, if you provide torso heating um, at a fairly large power requirement uh, of about 111 watts, is that you can see that uh, when you turn on torso heating in these individuals, uh, they can increase finger temperatures quite high. Um, Whereas in the other condition where there's no heating that, you know, you can put arctic mittens on, but it really doesn't help. Uh, temperatures stay quite low. And in fact, they saw the same, uh, same things in the, in the toes as well, where torso heating may, more or less didn't maintain, but at least kept it at a comfortable level, relatively comfortable, where no heating doesn't help. If we actually look at dexterity performance in these studies, this is sort of compiled from different studies from Breakovic over a number of studies. Um, is that you know you can see that if you're not wearing gloves, you get about you know about an 80% decrease in dexterity uh, over this 150-minute time period. If you provide torso heating but you still wear gloves, you still see this basically a 60% decline uh, from the beginning before exposure to the end of exposure. But you could be barehanded and provide this torso heating and essentially maintain dexterity over the course of these experiments while sitting in minus, 100, minus 25. Um, so again, 
great uh, way to show that, that auxiliary heating is quite efficacious. They also showed uh, along with this is body heat content is very important to this. It's, maybe it's just the idea that you're maintaining heat content. Uh, and if we look at this, we see a very uh, good relationship between the change in body heat content over time to the change and to the basically to the absolute mean finger temperature. Uh, excuse me. Oh, thank you. Well, I better quickly hurry up. So, um, so anyway, uh, and this was also seen by Flora. So that led to a question, could we have a very large power, you know, we basically have a large power consumption, can we decrease this at all? Um, so that led to some of, some of our experiments we were thinking about, what happens if we provide it less heating, less power, but try to target it? So one of the areas we thought about was the face from work from Bader, again, this goes back all the way to 48, and some other work from our lab, uh, or could we provide heat proximal as well? So we basically looked at, at a try to, you know, basically provided facial heating as well as forearm heating to see if we can improve dexterity. We had a variety of tasks that they did, um, and we measured a variety of physiological measures, the temperature, and again, we used some fine motor and more functional tasks of dexterity. And essentially what we showed is that when we combine both forearm and, um, and facial heating is that we could see about a three to 4% increase, a three, a three or four degree increase um, in, in hand temperature. But we also saw similar, but not to the same degree, though there's no difference here in hand temperature here when we just uh, provided forearm heating. Um, and then we also saw sort of a similar kind of finding in the finger as well. So we had an increase in, in, in hand temperature and finger temperature. No change in blood flow, though. We measured that. Um, so it's probably more just bulk heating coming into the forearm and then finding its way convectively to the hand. When we actually look at, at performance uh, of dexterity, we could see that basically we were able to maintain dexterity. So it's still a small decrease, uh, but basically maintain dexterity both in fine motor as well as with this magazine loading task, which is a functional task, a military task. Um, over the course of about 90 minutes. Um, so again, we're so, sure to show in sort of the efficacy of, of a reduced heating uh, and less power use. Again, we saw the same kinds of findings with strength of the fingers themselves, and essentially that forearm heating and combined were the same, uh, essentially maintaining temperature uh, across time. Uh, so again, small heating, but, but proven to show a, an increase in, in, in maintaining performance. So really in summary, kind of just want to outline some of these. So can we go through both aerobic and, and, and dexterity is that you know, we know that things like deep body and muscle temperature are quite important. Uh, and it appears that obviously reduced oxygen availability is, is a potential issue. Um, and again, there's different mechanisms for that. One of the most be important is, is lower muscle blood flow also, the idea that a heart rate can't get up as high. Uh, and there's, at least for what we presented today, an a de increased reliance on, on anaerobic metabolism. Um, in terms of, the, of hand function, uh, obviously cooling of skin and tissue is quite important, obviously, for decreasing performance of, of, the, of the periphery. Um, we know that we can improve uh, function with a, uh, a large global increase in body heat content um, but there's also some evidence that we see an improvement with focus heating that's proximal to the hand, which gives us some going forward to try to reduce power requirements so that a person, if, if in fact we do provide auxiliary heating, can have less battery on them, which means less weight uh, potentially or, or other power sources and, that, and can have potentially an improvement in their, in their hand function uh, when working in a cold environment. And that's what I, all I have here. Again, I want to just thank the team at Usarium uh, for, for all this work uh, and uh, look forward to hopefully continuing this line of work in the future. Thank you.